Hello and welcome to Uncorking a Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and today I'm excited to introduce you to Eileen Brill. Eileen is a painter, writer, sign language interpreter who grew up outside of Philadelphia and graduated from Carnegie Mellon with a BS in economics. She has written professionally for the restaurant, hotel, and commercial real estate industries. A Letter in the Wall is her debut novel. Here today to talk about that and so much more is Eileen Brill. Welcome to Uncorking a Story, Eileen. Thank you, Mike. Nice to be here. Oh, nice to have you here. So, Eileen, I'm going to ask you the question I ask everybody uh, out of the gate. Uh, Eileen, where does your story as a writer begin? Um, I guess I remember, well, I remember creating stories in my head before I could write. And uh, my mother would tell me bedtime stories that she made up. And then I would tell her one, usually every three, every three times I would tell her one. And you know, they're nonsensical the way children's stories are. Um, but my first memory of like an actual, something I wrote down was in fourth grade, uh, a friend and I wrote a school play for our class. And it was uh, sort of like, um, you know, going, going to the future with robots and stuff. And that was really cool. Um, but yeah, but I've been writing, I probably, before I wrote a letter on the wall, I started but never finished probably seven or eight <laughs> novels. And usually what was happening was I would get an inspiration, I'd start writing about something and then I'd realize I don't have enough life experience to finish this one, so I'll just wait. <laughs> and then <laughs> I had to get well into my 50s before that I had enough life experience that I felt like I could do this. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I can't let the, the fourth grade um, you know, story go, but uh, what, what was the name of that play? Do you remember what the name was? Oh my gosh, uh, oh my God. It wasn't like, it would have been funny if it was Back to the Future, because I feel like, I feel like we had the first Back to the Future, but it was something like that. And it was, yeah, these, uh, these two, a uh, boy and a girl that go into the future. And you know, it's funny because I remember that we, my class performed it in front of the whole elementary school. And I remember kids laughing and thinking it was funny, but it wasn't a comedy. <laughs> I remember I was just crushed. I'm like, no, this is a drama. They're laughing at us. And, the, you know, but I felt like, I felt like I had something, like I was yeah. on to something. I was, I was, I was going to do something. With, and then I wrote, you know, professionally after college, um, you know, sort of trend reports for different industries, which I felt like I, you know, did well, but it's certainly not creative. And I just, I'm like, you know, I know everyone has a book in them and I got a book in me. It's just waiting to come out, waiting to be born. Yeah, you probably don't want to get too creative with, you know, a trend report for, you know, like the restaurant industry, right? I mean, you don't want to like fictionalize that so much because people are making big decisions on that information, I would imagine. Yeah, well, I had a problem because sometimes I want to inject a little bit of creativity into it or a little humor or whatever. And I, you know, the, the manager was like, no, you're going to you're going to revise this. You're going to take that out. So right. I felt like I was pushing back, you know, like against my natural instinct. So that must have created a little bit of tension in you, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think I was, I kind of got it all together. I was a professional. I knew I was, people just wanted to know the numbers, just the facts, just the facts. But, um, you know, I, I have always written, I love, you know, I keep um, a journal. I sort of like, uh, you know, the uh, Anne Lamott uh Anne Lamott, right? The the uh, uh, the artist's way, writing, keeping a daily journal every day. I've been doing that probably since I was ten years old, and I do love to write. Um, my mother was a writer and a poet, and uh, and I think she really inspired me. Um, she, my book is dedicated to, and is in her memory because she really, you know, she got me reading at a young age and interested in writing. And, um, yeah, the whole creative side of me, I think. Came yeah, from, came from your mom. Uh, yeah. What was she? I mean, was she? Did she write for a living? I uh, know she was a social worker. She was a geriatric social worker. Um, but uh, I think she was a frustrated writer because, in fact, in in my in my book, a letter on the wall, there is one chapter where the protagonist is, um, uh, you know, three years old, just a toddler, and her mother. It's it's not a not giving anything away her mother uh, dies in the flu epidemic and you know she's kind of remembering her mother and remembering the stories that her mother would tell her and it was in the book I refer to the stories of sniff and ribbons a bunny and a kitten that were best friends and that was actually 
um, a reference to a story that my mom made up for me and used to tell me when I was little about, you know, sniffing ribbons and they were, you know, the domesticated kitten and the wild bunny and they became friends. And she had like all these stories in her head and she should have written them down because she could have had a great line of children's stories there. Yeah, I remember my, uh, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother when I was younger and she always told us, I have a twin brother uh, named Jimmy and she always used to put us to bed by telling us stories. Um, and it was like the highlight of the day, you know, it was like listening cool. to, listening to these stories. And I, I would, I have triplets, um, cause I had to outdo my parents. Um, <laughs> and awesome. I remember when I would put them, they're 20 now. So th this does not happen anymore or else it'd be creepy, but I used to put them to bed every night and I used to tell them stories. So my son would always want me to read a book. So he loved Madeline. He loved Harold and the Purple Crayon. Um, I was always reading him books. And my other daughter just was like, she's like, kiss me on the forehead. And then that's it. I don't need a story. I just want to go to bed. I'm like, okay. Now, daughter number three. So Gracie. Gracie was, it was never satisfied with a canned story. She would always want me to make up a story or tell her a story about my childhood. So I'd tell her these stories about things that would happen to me and my brother in childhood, but none of them were true. Um, none of them were true. Like they were all like these like fantasy type stories. And like a couple of years ago, <laughs> she, you know, I'm sitting with my brother and my daughter, Grace, and she's like, oh, do you remember that story, um, Uncle Jimmy, uh, about the balloon? And <laughs> He looks at me, he's like, what is your daughter? Is she on crack? Like, what is she talking about? And I'm like, oh, the story where uh, we came back from the fair and Jimmy let his balloon go and I gave him my balloon. But when we got home, his balloon was actually magically in our backyard. She's like, yeah, that one. I'm like, Chris, I made that up. That didn't happen. And just the look of sadness that came across her face oh. was just like I had murdered her or something. I stuck a knife in her heart. Trauma. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You should probably not told. She could have lived with this like illusion of this. Oh. Well, it would have worked if my brother would have played along, but he's like, yeah. oh, that never happened. What are you talking oh. about? I'm like, Jim, read the room, buddy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me about the impetus for, for this, uh, for this debut, um, uh, a letter in the wall. Tell me, you know, how this idea came to you um, when you started writing it. Just give me the story of it. Yeah. So um, in 2007, my family and I moved into this, three-story house and we had an electrician on the third floor putting in a new outlet in one of the bedrooms and he reached in for the wires and he pulls out this piece of paper and he's like oh this piece of trash I was standing there he was about to toss it I grabbed it and it was an envelope kind of like a tattered envelope that had been addressed and uh, to somebody in Collingswood New Jersey I opened up the envelope and the letter was written on personalized stationery and the address was my address. So I realized this was a letter that was never mailed. And of course I Googled the woman and it turns out that she and her family, they were the first owners of this house. And that, so the house was built in 1920. And the, and the letter was undated and it was very cryptic. It was sort of like, you know, written to this boy. She kind of referred to some, I mean, really written as if like they, she, it was like an inside story. and. But one thing it conveyed was kind of insecurity and uh, she used the word failure with in the letter. So I sensed that she, this boy was important to her and somehow she felt like a failure with him. So I did a little Google research and I got a lot of information about her family, um, but there wasn't a lot about her. But what I discovered was the one thing that was resounding was that she, was murdered in 1971. So of course that was like, that sealed the deal. I needed to know who this woman was. Yeah. Um, but it turned I'm hearing out. Keith Morrison from Dateline in my head right now, you know, <laughs> like I'm hearing him like, oh, tell me now more about this murder. You know, <laughs> I get so excited about murder. I um, know, who doesn't like a good murder? This, the, <laughs> the sad thing was it was, um, you know, it was, uh, the, it was a hung jury that, suspect was acquitted but you know something like newspapers.com is a great resource because even though i couldn't find a lot of information about her you know her life growing up it, they covered the murder and um it, it just sounds like the evidence was poorly handled and you know but one thing that i read which really kind of like i had originally thought i would write a biography of this woman because her life seemed you know she was raised 
as a Quaker by a very prominent Quaker family, all very well educated, very well off. And she strayed really far from Quakerism from what I could tell. And not only did she stray from her like religious and family roots, but she strayed geographically and ended up in Oklahoma and that's where she was murdered. So I wanted to write a biography, but the further and further I got into it, I thought I've got the, the skeleton of a really good fictionalized story here and I can just use my imagination because even if you know I can learn the dates that she was married and how many kids she had, I don't know the, the whys of why she did what she did and how she ended up there. So I have a pretty vivid imagination and I kind of, I, I became her in a way. I, I thought like her, I understood her motivations and I, and I guess that helped me write the story when I kind of gave I created explanations to why she made some of the horrible decisions that she made. Yeah. You know, what, what strikes me about the story isn't necessarily her story. I mean, that, that is fascinating, I think, but it's just you, you kind of coming across this letter and then just having enough curiosity to, to want to know more, you know, about her life. And then sort of almost like method act a way of, of writing her story and, and, and finding her voice through, through, through you and I guess your fingers. Um, what, what was the writing process like? Um, Cause as this is, I mean, you mentioned having written many sort of started many novels before, um, but, but for this one, like how, how, if at all, was this different from your other attempts? I guess I felt um, my curiosity was so strong and like, I love, first of all, I love doing research. And so the first part of this was just pure research, which was fun. And I went, you know, and not only did I look, you know, on the internet for information, but I went and talked to people. So I found out that she attended a certain high school. So I went there and met with the archivist and we tried to find any, you know, pictures of her, nothing was available. So that was fun. And I was meeting somebody and then I would go, I'd call the, uh, I called a uh, detective in Oklahoma who worked on cold cases and got information from him. So that part was kind of drawing me in. And once I decided that I, it was going to be a work of fiction, I was so psychologically invested in, in who she was. And it was not, you know, some writers will say, you know, they have to be, you know, it's hard because every day you must force yourself to sit down and write for a certain amount of hours and you have to be very disciplined. But with this, I had to pull myself away from my computer to stop working on it every day because, you know, I have other things in my life and people that depend on me. So um, this just felt like it was a part of me. And I, it's so crazy because when I think back now, it's almost like, I don't want to say it was easy, but it just felt so natural. Like each time I would kind of finish it, I finish a chapter and I look ahead and I think about the direction I was taking the story. I mean, I, I, I was, I had to work it out a little bit, like where, where did I want to go? Where did I want to take it? But it wasn't, it didn't feel like a struggle for some reason. I just felt so like, like, I was meant to tell this story. I don't know. I don't know how else to explain it. Yeah, no, it's almost like a like a spiritual calling in that regard. Um, yeah, I mean, kind of. I guess, yeah. So she was. I I have to be very careful to not make this as if you know I I'm not. It's it is a work of fiction, and I don't in any way want to say that I'm like writing a story about this real person. She was the inspiration. The letter was the inspiration, but I definitely do think that when um when a writer is has a character it works best when they really feel like not just that they know the words and the dialogue but that they know how that character thinks and what their motivations are it is it is kind of like method acting that's really interesting that yeah you said that. yes uh sometimes i say interesting things um <laughs> which uh which amazes me i actually had to write that down um <laughs> But, you know, just a, a few things just to reflect on here. Um, you know, number one, uh, um, the, the, the idea of getting lost in what you're writing is something that I can certainly relate to. Um, you know, and it's one of the I, things I love about writing is that, you know, you, you can do your own world building. You know, I think we have so much, so little control of the world we actually live in, but we have complete control over the worlds we create in, in stories and, and in, in the novels we write. 
Um, but I've, I've certainly been in those situations where I have lost hours um, of time feel that feel like minutes because you're so into what it is you are, you are doing, you're writing. I call it getting in the zone. Um, and it's yeah. like, it's like, like when I go for long runs and I get into the zone and I don't even think about, you know, breathing or moving my feet or, you know, and then, then, you know, the runner's high kicks in, which is fantastic. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I just love that getting in the zone, but, I, and I think it has to do with just like being so completely invested in something and, and just knowing you know, who it is you're writing about, like knowing these characters so well that you, you know, you are, you like become them and you think like them. And, and then you, then you take a break and go down to dinner and, you know, sometimes slip into, uh, I don't know. <laughs> How was your day, honey? Well, I killed three people today. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but it's, it's so true. And actually, you know what? It, it was fun because Joan, my protagonist, is nothing like me. And yeah, I guess it was fun. I was kind of being this person who was kind of times irrational or, you know, just fighting against people who were trying to be good to her. And, you know, that was kind of cool. And I think um, the cool thing is that I had to find a way to be empathetic to her, even if I completely disagree with the way she lived her life or the, or the decision she made. And I think that's, that's another thing that um, I guess writers are good at is, is empathy, right? Because yeah. you have to be able to relate and identify, you know, with your with your characters, even if they they could be despicable, they could be a murderer. You know? Exactly. I always like to say, like we, you know, Scrooge in A Christmas Carol, like when we first meet him, is a complete jerk. Like you do not like this guy. Why do we care if he turns his life around by the end of the story? But you know, the beauty of that, the way Dickens writes is, is he creates that empathy for, you know, you see him as the old miser, but then you get a chance and it's so creative to see him as like a young boy yeah. um, and, and see kind of what happened, how he got to where he was. And then by the end of it, you are so happy, you know, on Christmas morning when, you know, he's given the kid a shilling or whatever to, to get the biggest goose for the Cratchits. Um, but that's, you're right. I mean, authors have to build empathy for characters, even characters that are despicable. Yeah, definitely. And it's also nice when you see the evolution of a character who starts out like, you know, like Scrooge and you, you just like, come on, this guy's got to have some redeeming qualities. And then he evolves. And, you know, even with, with my character, she, um, I think she evolves. She, some people might think she never learns from her mistakes, but I do think that she evolves. I think that people, I think, what is it when, um, they talk about like characters either ev evolving or devolving, like, you know, someone good gone bad, like yeah. you know, there's the dark side or whatever, which is cool too. But I like, I just like, I like complicated people who aren't always likable. Yeah. I, I mean, I think of Walter White, you know, as, as somebody who, you know, yeah. does the wrong things for the right reasons, but then he becomes a monster. <laughs> right. Like the other That's process, great. but that is, that is, you know, you, you still root for him. <laughs> You know, you still root for him, yeah. but you know, there's gonna, there's, there's a bill to be paid at the end um, of, of Breaking Bad. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, the other thing I want to talk about is um, just this idea of finding a letter in the wall. So uh, my sister gave me a bunch of letters that I had written to my grandmother um, back in like the seventies. I mean, like I'm talking, like I was like three, four um like hand little maybe not handwritten notes but just kind of like little pictures and then as I got older you know you know it was chicken scratch because I can't you know I can't write very well um <laughs> it was illegible in other words um but I remember just kind of going through these letters that I wrote to my grandmother um and one of them funny enough had a dollar bill in it um because you know when I when I was sick my grandma would always send me like a dollar or something like that right um one time she got sick. So I wrote her, you know, a little get well card and I took a dollar out of my mother's purse and I put it in to oh. the letter. And I mean, I'm telling you, this was like 79. Um, and I found that letter with that dollar and I, I have the dollar. I actually keep the dollar in my passport holder um, because I never want to lose it. 
Um, <laughs> and I never want to spend it because, you know, it's worth much more than that to me sentimentally. <laughs> But, you yeah. know, people like I think about my kids, like they don't write. I have three 20 year olds. They don't write letters now. You know, everything is like text or Snapchat or or whatever. I that, that to me that there's that there's a lost art to letter writing. And it, it actually makes me sad to think about. Same. Yeah. In fact, I was thinking so for one of my um, events that's coming up, I was thinking, oh, I, I don't want it to be just a boring reading and Q&A. Like I want it to be interactive. And I thought maybe I would give everyone that comes, give them an uh, an envelope with a stamp on it and a piece of stationery and a nice pen and say, please write a letter to someone when you leave here, you know, anyone, write it to your grandmother or to an old friend or whatever. And I think the thing about um, writing letters is you, you're forced to sit down and think first. And there's not that send button where you're going to like screw up and then be like, oh, no, I didn't mean to send that to my boss or whatever. But you know, it is, it's a lost art and I still write letters. Um, and I also write, I have been doing this for years. I have a file of letters that begin with dear so-and-so. This is a letter I will pro probably never send to you <laughs> because I'm usually trying to vent or just yeah. say horrible things that, you know, I, a lot of them, you know, to friends or family members that I need to work out my thoughts. But yeah, I think it's a lost art for sure. Oh, it's cathartic. I mean, just that exercise. I mean, I know therapists use it, um, you know, mm -hmm. to, you know, writing a letter, burning the letter. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know, all, all that yeah. good stuff. Um, you know, on the business side of things, how did you go about getting this published? Um, you know, to, to talk to me about um, searching for an agent, querying, um, what, you know, did, did you go through that process? You know, what, what was that like? Yeah, so... Um, yeah, when I so I had worked with a developmental editor who had helped me sort of like with the direction and the of the story, and she comes from the publishing industry, so she kind of gave me some suggestions of you know where to look for publishers, and she kind of set up my expectations early, which was good because otherwise I think I would have been like you know devastated with all the rejections, but I kind of knew to expect it. <laughs> um, but each time I would hear about it, like a, I would kind of run it by her, like this is a you know, is this a reputable publisher? What do you think of this? And I got a lot of rejections. What happened more often than not was, you know, I'd send, I'd query a publisher or an agent and I'd send my, you know, whatever, one page sample. And they would ask either for more or for the whole manuscript. And then I'd get all excited and this is it. This is going to be my big break. And then they'd say, yeah, not quite what we're looking for. Um, and, I, you know, I've heard, you know, I've heard about writers waiting three or four years before they get an offer and I I'm like no I'm not waiting three or four years so uh, probably it wasn't quite a year maybe 10 months into the process I heard from um, a publisher called Spark Press which is uh, under the umbrella of She Writes Press and they are a hybrid and I didn't know anything about hybrids and my first question was oh this isn't one of those vanity publishers that I was told to stay away from and I so I talked to my developmental editor about them and she said no they are very reputable they have a very good reputation so I spoke with Brooke Warner the um the head of Spark Press and I then I called probably a dozen authors that that have published with Spark Press and got a really um you know kind of the writer's eye view of what it looked like to work with them and I decided you know I felt good about it and I I, I knew it was an investment you know it's sort of like I could go the different routes. I could go the self-publishing route. I could, you know, keep trying to get, you know, a traditional publisher. I could go with a hybrid. And I felt like th this was, this was a good fit. Um, and it's, a, you know, like I, I didn't realize it at the time, which is so silly now in retrospect, but I didn't think of publishing a book as a business, but it really is. You're investing some money and time and it, it's the payoff. I mean, I'm not, I hope I break even, we'll see, but you know, it, it's, years. I mean, books are timeless, right? I could, hopefully people are still buying my book in five years or 10 years, but I did it because I couldn't not write a book. I couldn't not publish this book. I had to get it out there and I just want people to read it and get something out of it. Yeah. I mean, it, but it is such a, a big, um, the, the publishing industry has changed so much. Um, you know, as you mentioned with, with, you know, I mean, Amazon did so much to disrupt publishing uh, by, by making it just so easy to, to independently publish. Um, 
but uh you know there is there is this this like old i don't want to say old mentality um there is uh, maybe ancient's a better word but when you try to go the traditional route and you know i talked to a lot of authors who were fortunate and successful and able to to do that you know they they line up the agent the agent lines up the the publisher and then you know two years later the book comes out um but you know we live in a culture now that that kind of wants instant gratification um, and, you know, the ability the these players, you know, like, like, you know, Spark Press, um, who, who have emerged um, and who are helping authors kind of do things quicker, still high quality things, um, but being able to kind of circumvent the, uh, the traditional way of doing things. I mean, if, if I worked in publishing now, I'd be, I'd be scared, you know, I, I definitely would be scared. For sure. Um, so let's, um, let's talk about some fun stuff. Um, yeah. cause I always like to, to get to know my, my guests a little bit more. And one way I do that is through, uh, pop culture. So uh, Eileen, tell me what were some of your favorite TV shows when you were a kid? Well, of course, Brady Bunch and Partridge Family and the Monkees and Gilligan's Island and Beverly Hillbillies. I could go on. And then when I got a little older, all in the family, of course, um, <sighs> trying to think I remember when I was very young maybe five there was a cartoon if you heard it well you're a little bit younger than me nobody even my contemporaries remember this but then I googled it and I sent it out to all my friends and people remember do you, do you this was past this was before you there was a cartoon called, and it was probably from uh, Japan Kimba the white lion I do not and remember I that. Loved Kimba. okay it was it was probably gone by the time you came along but Kimba loved Kimba I was, you know, you know, those like really kind of like, um, it was like early Japanimation, I guess. Yeah, I am. I remember like Speed Racer was kind of like, yes. like an early Japanimation kind of thing. Right. Um, Jim, Jim. You mentioned, you mentioned the Partridge family. And I, I just, I, I'm going through these old pictures um, of, of my parents. And my parents are about to turn 90 and 89 this summer. Um, and I found a picture. My parents went to the Tony Awards one year. Uh, cause my dad worked for American express and they had a big deal with, um, playbill, the, the people who published playbill. Yeah. Um, so he, he got to go to the Tonys and seated at my mother's table, um, this year was Keith Partridge. Um, oh. so yeah, she's sitting next to, to, um, Oh my God. Why am I spacing David on Cass this? David, David Cassidy. Cassidy. I almost said Jack Cassidy and I'm like, no, right. Jack Cassidy was in a hundred Columbus. No, David <laughs> Cassidy. Um, and so I'm like, this is one of the coolest pictures like I, I saw. And then, and then just to blow me away even more, who else is there? Luke Skywalker, Mark Hamill. He must have done some, some Broadway stuff. And that year they got me a playbill signed. Uh, and then said, Mike and Jim, may the force be with you, Mark oh. Hamill. Can I just tell you like how happy I was as a kid? Your um, life could end right getting there. That? And... Yeah. I mean, I could have ended at 10 and it would have been, it would have been fulfilled. <laughs> Luke Skywalker wrote me a letter. <laughs> well, you know, this is really, it's ironic that you're bringing up those two actors because they were originally both supposed to be my husband. So it's oh. kind of funny. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, that was the plan, go. but they, they messed up. I don't know. They were both. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, but yeah, I, I, I was a kid of the seventies watched so much TV. Oh yeah. It was like our babysitter. Really? Yes. I mean, it was our babysitter um okay how about this uh favorite musical artist we'd find um if we went through your your phone right looking at your playlist who, who would we find represented uh musically oh my god put me on the spot here so i i have i'm all over the place so i you know definitely love classic rock i love steely dan i love uh um elvis costello van morrison but i also i really love lizzo uh beck um Ben Folds, Ben Folds Five, uh, Elton John, um, yeah. And then I, I also like. I, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be afraid to say this anymore. I like Barry Manilow. Okay, I like him. I, not, nothing wrong with admitting to liking Barry Manilow. He, he maybe because of my childhood. Uh, let's see, love. Um, and then you know, my my sons. I have a 24 year old and a 27 year old, and they. They, they think it's really funny because I'll have all these artists on my playlist that I, I don't know. I couldn't even tell you their names, but I like their stuff. And 
you know, they're all on there, but I don't, they're, you know, people that are from the last five years. So I don't even know their names, but I, I just like to, I like a kind of a wide variety of music. I like, uh, well, who's the guy that did, now see this is embarrassing, to pimp a butterfly. That was, come on. No, well, yeah. you're asking the wrong guy. Come on, all right. <laughs> if it wasn't you too, I probably don't know it. <laughs> you too, there's another one, yeah. Um, Johnny Mathis is on my playlist. Uh, yeah. I'm all over the place. Yeah, no, it's a nice eclectic playlist. I mean, I've got everything from like, I love seventies. Like, I don't know when this happened because I grew up as like a metalhead. Like I love iron. I still do iron maiden, you know, eighties hair bands, yeah. but now like at like dinner, I mean, I usually put on like John Coltrane or something at dinner. Um, but I love like seventies soft rock. Like, I don't know what happened to me, like what pill I swallowed or what shot somebody gave me. But I listened to like, you know, 70s, like Yacht Rock. I'm like, totally wow, this is actually it. really good. No, but this, so there's some, there's some songs from that genre that I actually, I can't physically listen to because I get really choked up. Um, um, there's that song, Shannon. Shannon is gonna, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. The guy's dog went into the ocean and drowned. It's a true story. I can't listen. So there's some I know what you're talking about that music, but some of those songs, they get me in the gut. I can't listen to them. Yeah, they're, no. They're yeah, I, oh, I got it. We had joy. We had fun. We had seasons in the sun. Oh, you remember abs that one? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that's a kid that's dying. Da, 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 yes. Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember there was an old commercial. Um, it was probably in the 80s for like one of those like Time Warner music collections. And it was called Freedom Rock. And the, the commercial was so... I mean, like if you go on like YouTube, just like Google Freedom Rock, it's like these two hippies like sitting outside with a radio and they, the one guy goes, hey, is that Freedom Rock, man? Yeah, man. Well, turn it up, man. And all of a sudden, like, you know, I think Seasons in the Sun was on there. You know, there was like like hippie, like a lot of like hippie dippy type type songs. Yeah. I just remember that. Like Layla made it to that. I'm not sure how oh, that yeah. fit, but I remember the riff from Layla um, on there. Um, but anyway, moving on, um, how do you feel when you're staring at a blank piece of paper or a blank computer screen, um, intending to write something? So you're sitting down, you're journaling, you are writing a, you know, your second novel. Um, how do you feel when you're looking at that blank page? Uh, like I want to doodle on it. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> right. Cause I like to doodle and I like art and I'll doodle the easy and doodling is easily here than pulling stuff out of my brain and no but um it depends recently maybe because I, I feel saturated right now from this book if I sit down like if I if it's time to write a blog for my website or my newsletter I'll sit down and I'll initially I'll get an idea it'll sound really good and I'll be typing and sound really creative and this is funny and everything and I come back to the next day and I'm like this is garbage and I throw it out and so I feel like um I don't know maybe I have i I'm putting pressure on myself. Like, I feel like I have a lot to live up to now because I just wrote a book that I'm really proud of and I, that felt good. And now everything I write is garbage. So I'm, but I'm still writing. I'm, I'm just, when I think about writing for someone else to read, I get, it's a little, I guess it's pressure filled, um, which is why I just resort to doodling instead. Cause that's just fun, you know? Well, doodling is kind of writing. I mean, can I, I always think to myself, you know, writing isn't writing isn't always like the physical act of writing, like thinking can be writing. Mm -hmm. um, and doodling can certainly bring you, you know, it's it's an action, but it can help you, you know, that, that might, you know, you might doodle something you see, and that could inspire something. That's true. Yeah. I think that um, also, I'm really trying to be true to myself and my voice. And so I want to like, sometimes I feel like when I'm writing now, I'm, I've got the old imposter syndrome thing. Like that's, you know, that's, I hate that by the way. I hate it. But um, I think I, what I'm, it's almost like I'm waiting to relax back into who I am or to find, you know, to be inspired in such a way that I don't feel like I'm, it's like, I'm pushing myself, but um, I still, I mean, I still write every day and I still journal and I, do, I make sure I do something creatively with writing every day. Um, and it, that just feels good just to do that. But yeah, like, you know what it is? These days, 
when I pick up a blank piece of paper, what I'm writing is my to-do list. <laughs> That's it. <I'm laughs> the punch list for it. the day. Yes. Yeah. More than ever. No, right. But be, it would be interesting to publish a collection of to-do lists, um, you know, over 365 days. I mean, that, that actually might be fascinating. Wait, that's actually a really good idea. <laughs> I won't steal it. You should do that's that. Okay. that but, uh, look, you keep to-do I, lists? I, I receive to-do lists. I do not write them. <laughs> they are given to me. <laughs> they are bestowed to me as gifts. <laughs> Are you good about the checking off? The I'm, I'm, you know, I, at least two thirds. Um, you can't do everything a hundred percent because then the expectations are too high. For you sure. gotta just, just deliver just under, under the bar a little bit. Yeah. That's actually a good way to look at it. <laughs> um, uh, what lesson, I mean, just having, having just gone through this publishing process, um, what, what lesson about publishing do you feel like you, you may have learned or had to learn the hard way? Well, I didn't realize how competitive, you know, I didn't realize that the competition for readership, like, you know, which is <laughs> like, why is that competitive? But I think that, you know, which is why it's so important if, if you have something you want published, you go with either, you know, publishing house or if, if you're self-publishing, do it in a way that you're gonna, you're gonna, um, feel comfortable in the whole process because in the end once the, the published getting it I don't know that was almost like the easier part the hard part comes you've signed a publishing contract and now the marketing begins and the publicity and I didn't realize the competition I, I read somewhere that every year there's about a million new books on the market but only about you know a little more than 30 percent of our country read on a regular basis <laughs> so you're competing and then you have the readers that you know at least people who read novels go back to some of their tried and true favorite authors so if you're a debut author you know you really you really have to put yourself out there and think of it as a business and not be modest that's the first thing i learned like stop being modest stop downplaying what I did just get out there and say, I got this story. I wrote it. You're going to love it. Please buy my book. And, you know, I, I was never on social media before this. And I actually see, I see the point of it now, yeah. you know? So I guess I'd say, you know, if you have a story that you want out there, you're going to have to make some concept concessions, but, um, you know, be true to yourself, find a good fit and just realize that it's, it's, it's sobering. It's eye-opening, you know? Yeah. I mean, there is a modesty. I think many authors have, um, which is a detriment. Um, because I think, you know, writing itself is, is a very, it's individualistic. Um, it is a solitary process. Um, and not everybody is, um, outgoing, not every, you know, just, just personality wise, you know, you know, some people are a bit more introverted, but, you know, you have to think you thought that this story was good enough to invest, you know, hundreds, thousands of hours to, to write, you felt it was good enough to get published um, and that other people should read it. So you have to walk into, you know, doing publicity and thinking, yeah, I mean, mod put modesty on a shelf somewhere because, you know, there's no room for that when you're trying to, to kind of break through. Um, there's so many different choices people can make. I mean, go on Amazon, go, go into any, even a small independent bookstore and you could be overwhelmed by the number of choices you have. Um, yeah. So yeah, gotta, gotta give some, someone a reason to pull you off the shelf. Definitely. But you know, there's such a great community of writers that I've, I've met, um, you know, because actually <laughs> because of being on something like Facebook and everyone, it's comforting to see so many people going through those same thoughts and feelings and yeah and just like getting the support I mean I it's it's wonderful and we all it's funny because like I'm on this one uh, Facebook group that's for debut authors and we all talk about how like you're you're happy with a colleague's success but you're also pissed off about it and you're like that should be me and it's real like whatever you're feeling it's it's real it's just natural to have some envy but then you move on and you you know, learn how to, you know, channel that, those feelings into, you know, putting yourself out there. And that's probably the biggest change I went through was just feeling like there's no time for 
insecurity or second guessing myself. And I think it's paid off because people say, you know, oh, you've got me so excited about your book. I want to read it. And I think I'm, I think I learned how to talk about myself and, and the book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It was a learning process. Definitely. Yeah. You mentioned like kind of a little bit of jealousy, professional jealousy when somebody does well. I mean, I noticed in on the comedy side, so the, you know, the, I I also do some stand-up comedy and just hanging around comics. um, They don't necessarily love it when you do well. Um, You know, if you're sharing the stage with them, they really love it when you bomb because, you know, it it just makes them, for some reason, it just makes them so happy. (laughs) You know, and and, um, I'm not saying I'm like that, but, um, you know, but it also gives you something to to rib other people with too, you know? Yeah, (laughs) for sure. Oh my God. And like, it's natural. Isn't that horrible? No, it's not horrible because you know what? We're all human. And yeah. yeah. You don't totally. want to feel like someone's you, you're lesser than someone or. Like yeah. Well, as we wrap up here, I always like to end on this one, which is, and it is, it's apropos because we're talking about a, a story uh, called a letter in the wall, a book called a letter in the wall inspired by a letter in the wall. Um, <laughs> if you could write a letter to your younger self, maybe it's that fourth grade you know, Eileen, who wrote, uh, wrote that school play, uh, which wasn't supposed to be funny, but apparently was. Um, if you could write a, a letter to that uh, younger Eileen and mail it to her, um, what would you tell? What, 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 would, what would you say to her? How would you reassure her? I'd say, dear Eileen, um, when you have an idea in your head, talk to people you respect and get their opinion because you do not know everything and you're making decisions in your head and not getting any feedback from those who know. So if you move forward and don't be afraid and talk to people and kind of get it out of, get it out of your brain and, and out in the atmosphere. There you go. Have a conciliary. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Eileen, this was a fun conversation. The book, A Letter in the Wall is, I will tell everybody where they could, uh, where they could pick it up, Eileen. Well, you can pick it up at your local independent bookshop. You could go to bookshop.org or Barnes and Noble or Amazon or anywhere you buy books. So you can go to eileenbrill.com and I'll direct you right there. There you go, Eileen. Thank you very much for a fun conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. It was lovely. Thanks so much.